from the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal. This is Free Expression with Jerry Baker. Hello and welcome to the Free Expression podcast from the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal. I'm Jerry Baker, editor at large of the journal. If you're not already a subscriber to this podcast, please do sign up at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever indeed you listen. This week, who won? Who lost? Who's still standing? Yes, of course, the presidential election of 2024 got underway in earnest this week with the first primary debate. Eight Republicans lined up for the Fox News hosted debate in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. One candidate, of course, didn't line up. Donald Trump skipped the debate in favor of an amiable chat with uh, Tucker Carlson on another platform. But Trump currently, of course, has a roughly 40 percentage point opinion poll lead, according to national polls, over all the other candidates. Now, in some ways, perhaps Wednesday's debate could be framed as a race for second place, or at least a chance for someone to show that they have the character, the campaign, and the candidacy to give Trump a real run for his money in the Republican nomination race. So what's the right verdict, having watched the debate? Well, I'm joined this week, I'm pleased to say, by a veteran of many, many presidential debate prep sessions and spin rooms and indeed, of course, presidential campaigns. That's former strategist for George W. Bush and my fellow columnist on the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal, Carl Rove. Carl, thank you very much for joining Free Expression. You bet. Thanks for having me. Well, so it was a big night in the uh, 2024 presidential election, the first debate of the primaries. It wasn't quite as big, I suppose, as it could have been, given the notable absentee. And we'll talk about him, of course. But you were there on Wednesday night. We watched you on Fox News giving your instant analysis, and we watched you talking about it today, too. But as the dust has settled and you've had a chance to consider the debate, what's your primary takeaway from this first Republican debate? My view is that everybody had a chance to introduce themselves, and most of them did a pretty good job of it. Those of us who pay attention to politics think everybody's paying as much attention as we are. But the vast majority of people who tuned in last night, it was their first chance to sort of see these people and see them perform. It's not really a debate because you've got eight people on the stage and the one who spoke the most got 12 minutes out of the time. And that was broken up into five or six different little episodes. But Ron DeSantis survived and that's what he needed to do. He was expected to be on the receiving end of a lot of arrows, and he had a few, but he survived. Yeah, I want to talk about, about DeSantis, and we'll, we'll cut him through several of the major candidates. But let's, if we may, let's start with the man who's kind of making the most noise. He kind of made the most noise on the night. He didn't have the longest speaking time, as you say. But Vivek Ramaswamy, who um, was very vocal, very articulate, spelt out his case, was, I suppose, you know, he has made a lot of impact. Some of the early sort of immediate reactions suggested he perhaps made the most impact. And he's, he's running very much as the kind of Trump acolyte, really. I mean, and there he was last night, most forcefully defending Trump, describing as the greatest president of the 21st century. And admittedly, there's not a lot of competition for that job. And I know you surely, Carl, have a stronger candidate for that title. But that's what he said. What was your view of Ramaswamy? And again, you've seen him a lot more than, than most other people have. But there he was on the debate stage. He did make quite an impact. What did you think? I thought glib, fast talking and provided the worst moment of the evening. The line of I'm as the only one on this stage who's not bought and paid for. Really? You're standing next to a guy who is the governor of the second most popular or third most populous state in the union, who served in the United States Congress, who, after graduating from Harvard Law School, joined the Navy in order to become a lawyer for the Navy SEALs and saw combat in Iraq. Exactly who bought and paid for him? Standing on the other side of you was the first woman governor of South Carolina who represented the United States at the UN as an articulate, strong conservative. Exactly who's bought and paid for her? And same for everybody else on there. Vice President Mike Pence, who bought and paid for him? Here's a man who served as a member of Congress, as the governor of Indiana, and served in the Trump administration. So I thought he was glib, fast talking, had a smile on his face. But I thought at the end of the night, that is the guy who's the Professor Hill or P.T. Barnum on the stage, the performance artist, not a guy who's capable of being the president of the United States, capable of being a good debater. The Harvard education gave him that. But it's not going to stand up well over time. And you see it in his campaign. But last night, for example, you know, the country is in a disaster. And whose fault was it? It was the fault of everybody on the stage because he said, you know, give them a second chance after they've screwed it up. When did they screw it up? Was it during those years that Donald Trump was president of the United States? Is that why we're in such a dark place? Or is it because the policies of the current Democratic administration? What do you think about his effect, though, on primary voters? I mean, one of the funniest lines I think somebody had about him I saw today was obnoxious but effective. I mean, what's he trying to do with primary voters? One of the, one of the, again, one of the issues, I think, with, with Ramaswamy that some of us are struggling to understand is if he likes Donald Trump so much and describes him as the greatest president of the 21st century, why on earth is he running against him? What, what's he trying to do in running in this campaign if he thinks Donald Trump should be president? Well, there are two things here, two questions. One question is, what does this do with the voters? 
And then what's his real goal? I think his real goal is he wants to be Donald Trump's running mate. He says, no, no, I don't want to be vice president. But everything that he does is designed to say, ingratiate him with the maximum leader. So, you know, I'm going to call him the greatest president of the 21st century, but I'm running against him. And this is a complete and utter mitigated disaster. The country is in a very dark place. I'm not going to fire at Biden. I'm going to spend my time beating up on Republicans when the last Republican president was Donald J. Trump. So I see this as a very clever way for him to audition to be his running mate and failing that to play a role in his administration. Maybe I can be secretary of the Treasury if I can't be the vice president. But the irony is, is that I think the effect on the electorate is going to be to take people who say, I like Donald Trump, I want Donald Trump, but he's got too much baggage. He's a way station for them to move away from Donald Trump. Let's talk about Ron DeSantis then. You say you think he came through okay. There were a couple of moments, though, I think where um, certainly I thought, and I think a lot of other people thought, there were kind of a little bit cringy moments. I mean, one, um, ones which is doing the round on social media a lot today, Thursday, is um, where he does seem to pause when Brett Baer asked whether they still support Donald Trump if he was convicted and he was the Republican nominee. And kind of like Ramaswamy's hand shoots in the air as fast as it can go. A couple of the others put their hands up. And, and, and DeSantis seems to wait and actually wait and look to see what the others and then sort of rather tentatively puts his hand up. The other kind of bad moment I thought for him was when Brett Baer's asking, did Mike Pence do the right thing on January the 6th and would they support him? He kind of really waffled and hesitated before finally it had to be kind of coaxed out of him to say yes. Both of that suggests that one of the problems with DeSantis is he's really trying to have it both ways, isn't he? He's trying to kind of signal to the Trump supporters that, yeah, I'm kind of one of yours, but also he doesn't really want to go fully in to endorse Donald Trump. And he's just in danger, isn't he, of falling between those two stools? I think that's a good point. I mean, we saw it earlier when, on Ukraine because when he made his first comment about it being a territorial dispute, up popped the video from him not too many years ago as a member of Congress at Emory Riddle University in his district talking about Putin being a threat and Putin's seizure of Crimea and how this was a danger to U.S. interests and our allies and we can't tolerate it. And then, you know, not too many years later, it's like, oh, well, I'm, I'm mimicking the maximum leader. And so I've got to say territorial dispute. But I'm not going to go as far as he did. But yeah, I think he's got to understand. And I think his people do understand. I think he on some level gets it. He's got to be his own man. He cannot be sitting there thinking about how can I frame this in such a way as not to offend Donald Trump. People are going to say, I'm going to vote for DeSantis, not because he seems like Donald Trump, but because he seems like Ron DeSantis, the successful governor of Florida. So he's got to figure out how to stop the instinct to sort of mimic, you know, give him a half Trump rather than giving him a full DeSantis. But where you started, I thought that was a great moment because yeah. it reminded me of that high school quiz. Who knows the answer to this question? And up shoots, you know, the smartest guy in the room. His arm goes way up real quick. And then there's one guy who sort of waits until the either the student body president or the captain of the football team raises his hand yeah. before he'll raise his yeah. hand. Yeah, he wants, he wants to be seen to be, uh, to be that he knows the answer, but he, does, he doesn't want to be called on. Exactly, that's right. But the, the DeSantis problem does point up the kind of bigger problem here, isn't it? Which is that I think DeSantis and maybe some of the other candidates are still struggling with how do you run against Trump? I mean, Vivek has decided, look, I'm all in on Trump, okay? I love the guy. He's the greatest president, you know, we've had and all this kind of stuff. I think it's pretty clear, obviously, Christie, and I think it's increasingly clear Mike Pence take the opposite view. The other, so, I mean, and maybe even to some extent Nikki Haley, but Ron DeSantis and we can talk Tim Scott, they don't seem to want to take a side in that. Do you think they're going to have to eventually? Well, look, I have a slightly different view. I think there's no need to go full Monty right at the beginning. But I thought last night, Nikki Haley in particular did a good job of beginning that process in, in front of a national audience. I mean, she started off by saying, we have a huge problem spending, and let's be honest about it. It happened because our last Republican administration spent a lot. And then she, I, I thought on Ukraine and the challenges to the country from China and Russia was pretty darn good and began to sort of show some distance between herself and President Trump. So we look at if the first debate, well, you've got to lay it out all there. No, no, no. You've got at least three shots at this if you are the four or six who are likely to be in the, you know, in the next debate and the debate after that. I, I agree with you about Nikki Haley, by the way, and I thought she was actually the most impressive candidate there. I think she gave smart answers, exactly as you say, on Ukraine, on spending. I think I know, I'd be interested in your view on what she said about abortion. That was really interesting that she really kind of she took on this idea of a federal legislation to bar abortion strongly. She talked about the party being out of touch with women on this issue. But I wonder whether that sounds like a general election message. Absolutely. We are seeing Republicans, you know, across the country, even in some unexpected places, getting in serious trouble over the abortion issue because they're seen as being too anti-abortion, too restrictive, too pro-life. How effective is that going to be, in your view, in the Republican primary, her trying to make that particular point about abortion? 
First of all, what was interesting, let's step back for a minute. Abortion took up the largest chunk of any issue that was discussed last night, which said to me that everybody's trying or a number of people are trying to have a position that, that grabs them an element of the party. And Mike Pence was clear. I'll do anything I can at the state and federal level. And you're right. In contrast to that, Nikki was, I'm fine with South Carolina having a six week ban. But we better recognize as a party, we don't have 60 members of the Senate. And so on a national level, be focused on things on which there's a broad consensus. But this issue is going to be settled and should be settled in an act of federalism at the state level. What's interesting is the evolution of all of this. You know, if you had said six weeks before the Supreme Court decision, if you'd said to pro-lifers, how about if we have states able to pass laws 15 weeks, 14 weeks, 13 weeks, four exceptions, parental notification, involvement of parents in the decisions of their teenage daughters, they would have said, I'm for that. I'll go for that in a nanosecond. But once we got the decision, suddenly we have people in our party who say, you know what, no abortions, no how, no way. And if you're not with me on whatever, you know, either no abortions or six weeks, I'll see you in the primary. You know, sort of like the Supreme Court decision unleashed some of the worst instincts we won at the court, which returned it to the state's So at the states, we've got to demand the most extreme measures. And while we're at it, even though we know that we can't get it, let's demand that we have a federal ban, which, again, has no chance of passing the United States Senate and being signed into law and runs counter to what we've been arguing for the last 40 some odd years, which is return this to the states and let the states make the decision. This is not something that is embodied in the U.S. Constitution. And yet you look at that, obviously, the early states, particularly everybody's focused on Iowa, the Iowa caucus is the first up. That kind of pretty hard line position, that is probably going to play pretty well, isn't it, in Iowa? It, it will. Iowa has the Iowa caucus goer population has a significant element of evangelicals and pro-life that dominates the party generally. But it's amazing to me because if you look inside, you'll have a lot of people who say, you know what, I can support 12 weeks, 15 weeks, 14 weeks. I can support for exceptions, and they can get reelected with that. We have very, as a country, some very ambivalent and conflicting views on abortion. You know, two-thirds of the American people did not want Roe v. Wade overturned, and two-thirds of the American people do not want abortions in the second and third trimesters. In fact, it's far more than two-thirds by the time you get to the third trimester. So, you know, this is one where if we, I hate to say it, if we had a law like France, 14 weeks, three or four exceptions, parental notification, that would be a winning issue because it would expand the culture of life and bring allies into the fight. Because, look, there are a lot of people who say I'm in favor of a woman's right to choose. But the idea of an abortion in the second trimester, the third trimester is increasingly in this age of the sonogram abhorrent to them. I want to talk about some of the other issues, too, that were raised. But let's very quickly just go through one or two of the other candidates in particular. Mike Pence, he got the most speaking time, uh, as we discovered, and he used it to talk a lot about abortion, as you mentioned. He talked a lot about Ukraine. And, of course, he got some strong support from Chris Christie over what he did on January the 6th, not so much from some of the other candidates, maybe. Again, he clearly, in his campaign, in his campaign launch a couple of months ago, he really came out hard against Donald Trump and what Donald Trump did on January the 6th. I'm having a hard time understanding how strongly that is going to play, and especially given that he's, you know, you've got Christie who's hitting Trump from the other side, from the same side, rather. How do you think Pence did last night? I think he did well. Like you, I have, I'm I'm skeptical of how powerful a message that will be out in the hinterland in terms of converting people to vote for him. But in terms of raising respect for the man, I thought it was a very profoundly important statement last night, and it's important to the process. I think if Trump is to be defeated, part of it will be that people say, you know what, Mike Pence defended our Constitution on a day where he and the president differed mightily about what the appropriate role of the vice president was. Mike was right. Trump was wrong. And I think that's important to the dialogue. Mike Pence has come to our Texas. uh, We have a big voter registration effort, secret voter registration effort that's registered a half a million additional Republicans in Texas in the last four years. And we had him speak. Two years ago, we had Chris Christie, Tom Cotton, Ron DeSantis, Mike Pence, Mike Pompeo, Marco Rubio, Rick Scott, and Tim Scott. But only one of them, when he walked into the room, was not even introduced, was walking to the stage to be introduced. Everyone in the audience stood and applauded. And it was Mike Pence. The question is, can he translate that into votes? And that's what elections are all about. Clearly, there's an element of the part. If you had to take the always Trump vote, it's hard to say who would be more reviled in their ranks, Mike Pence or Chris Christie. But among the party writ large, there are a lot of people who do have enormous respect for him. And the question is, is he going to be able to convert that? I'm I'm watching because I think it's an interesting experiment. You saw his message, which is, 
I am the Reagan Republican. I am the person who believes in strong national defense, in limited government. I have stood as a conservative against needless spending and a federal encroachment upon the states, and I'm strongly pro-life, and I am in the mold of Ronald Reagan, optimistic about the future of our country. Notice that moment last night when he went at Vivek on Vivek's, you know, we're in a dark hole in America's, you know, and he went at Adam. And that, I think, was a deliberate thing on his part because he wants to be the optimistic morning in America. We can we can turn around Republican. And there's a lot of interest in that and a lot of natural reaction among people who came of age during the Reagan Bush years. We're going to take a break there. When we come back, I'll have more with Carl Rove on this week's first Republican debate. And also we'll be talking more about the direction and future of the Republican Party itself. Stay with us. You're listening to Free Expression with Jerry Baker. Don't forget, you can listen to the latest episode anytime on your smart speaker. Just say, play the Opinion Free Expression podcast. Now, back to Jerry Baker. Welcome back. I'm talking with Carl Rove about this week's first Republican presidential primary debate. Well, let's talk briefly about Chris Christie. Seems to me Christie's only there, and he's kind of made it plain he's only there to take down Trump. When Trump's not there... In a debate like that, he doesn't really have a role, does he? I thought he had a sort of a hard time starting. He did eventually manage to find a way of taking a two by four to Vivek, who is obviously the Trump surrogate. But without Trump on the debate stage, and you know, as far as we know, Trump is saying he's not going to take part in any of these debates. It's hard for Christie to get much traction, is it? Well, I'm not certain I agree with that because we learned something last night about Chris Christie, we meaning the, the electorate broadly, that we're not getting in, in the snippets of him on television. And that is he was a very successful governor of a blue state who did a lot of interesting things, cut the taxes, cut the gravy train for state employees. And frankly, that's one of the reasons why he's doing well in New Hampshire. He's hanging out there, but he's not just talking about Donald Trump. He's talking about the Chris Christie vision. Here's what I did as a governor. And I will take these kind of things to the White House. Yeah, it'd be better if Trump was there. We would have, we would have, I mean, can you imagine two large forces like that going at each other? It would not be to Trump's advantage to do so. The best thing is just to, you know, wave him off. But absent that, he did get some shots in about Trump. And one of the one of the most effective ways to do that was he showed himself to be generous and outgoing and by complimenting Mike Pence. And, and leading the cheers for Mike Pence on that. But yeah, no, I thought he had a good opening and a good closing. And particularly, I was I was a governor of a blue state and uh, got things done. I'm sorry to say this, but the only thing that people really remember these days, especially Republicans, about Christie's governorship was the, uh, the, the embrace on the beach with Barack Obama and shutting the George Washington Bridge and that reminding people of his governorship doesn't necessarily work all that well for him. Well, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not certain how many remember... New Yorkers and New Jersey people remember the remember the bridge, but you know, look. The fact of the matter is, is he was a successful governor if you look at policy. And when the president comes to your state during a natural disaster, I don't begrudge uh, hugging with it. The mayor of New Orleans, who later went to jail, and the governor of Louisiana, a Democrat, hugged George W. Bush a lot in the aftermath of the treatment. <laughs> but, so I, I I'm sure it was nothing to do with hugging the president, your your former boss, the president. But it didn't sound like it did them much good either. Anyway, but well, we'll. Move on. Tim Scott, we should talk about. I mean, I, I think most people think he was a bit of a non-event last night. How did you think he did? He gave a chance to talk about his inspiration. He showed the best sort of self-effacing humor. But yeah, he, he was the one who, you know, he can have a moment. But he's got to get prepared for that moment. And the moment is to take that aspirational story that we're hearing and turn it into something where people say, I have a better sense that he is worthy of being behind the Resolute desk in the Oval Office making decisions. And last night, he didn't have enough time to do it. And the, frankly, the questions didn't give him a chance to do it. And he didn't take a question and turn it into an excuse to do that. But, you know, look, people saw him last night. They heard him. He's a, an attractive figure. And the self-effacing humor goes a long way. And just quickly, because we shouldn't exclude them, obviously, but Doug Burgum, I mean, I think a lot of people actually were quite sort of favorably surprised by Doug Burgum. I mean, no disrespect to the man, but governor of a very small state, had very little name recognition, I would think. And same with Asa Hutchinson, uh, also governor of a relatively small state. But Burgum sort of seemed to make quite a favorable impression. Hutchinson, I think, was kind of low energy. I think everybody agreed he did have his one moment where he sort of very clearly put up his hand saying he couldn't support Donald Trump and I thought gave a very eloquent statement about that. But those two, they're kind of still there really just making up the numbers, aren't they really? I think they added to the general impression. I think if you were watching this as a Republican, just sort of interested in in the process, you would look at that stage and say, what a lot of accomplished people. And I think that was one of the things that Burgum and Hutchison, and you're right, they've been in the different ways. I mean, North Dakota is not a big state. 
But I think people were impressed. Here's a guy who comes from a small town and builds a business there in North Dakota that is a global company and sells it to Microsoft for billions and then becomes the governor of a state that is producing the second largest amount of hydrocarbons in the, in the country. And so I think where people were impressed. And I also think Asa, it was like, look, I was governor and here's what we did. And when he came around to fentanyl, he here was the guy who was the DEA. And when we came to the border, he was the guy who was at Homeland. So you're right. They didn't break out. But I think they both added to the general sense of the Republican field has some very accomplished people in it. All right. We've talked a little bit about him, obviously, but let's address directly the uh, what Brett Baer called the uh, the elephant not in the room, which is uh, Donald Trump, of course, who did his own separate thing uh, on the platform formerly known as Twitter last night. That didn't seem to, to make any significant waves there. But what's your set? I mean, you know, he... He declined to take part in the debate. In some ways, you can see the logic of that. He's got a 40-point lead in the opinion polls. You've just talked about what Chris Christie might have done to him. What has he possibly got to gain by showing up for these debates when you have that kind of a lead? But what's your sense of how it worked out for him last night? Did it basically leave him unscathed? Or do you think that you started to see some signs that maybe there are some vulnerabilities there? Well, look, I already see some vulnerabilities. As I put in my column this week, take a look at the polls in the two early states, Iowa and New Hampshire, and compare President Trump's standing in those two states to his nationwide number. And there's a big disparity. And I think that gap is going to continue to grow. And I think we're as more people sort of tune in and begin to take in more information, I think there is going to be a, a decline in his numbers. I, I got to tell you, stepping back, though, and, and look, we all get to opine on this. But looking at this, I'm not certain I agree with the strategy. The fundamental assumption is I'm ahead and I want to create a sense of inevitability. Okay, that's a little bit dangerous because what you're doing is raising the expectations. And particularly if you're like Trump and you've got to say to everybody, well, I'm 60 points ahead. No, you're not 60 points ahead. Nationwide, you're at 55.1 in real clear politics. And the next guy is at 19. So you're not 40 points ahead of everybody. You know, 45% are either for somebody else or undecided in the nationwide number. And in Iowa, you're at 42 and 58 percent are for somebody else who are not yet making an opinion. And one poll showed them at 33 with 67 percent for somebody else are not yet decided. So inevitability is dangerous. Having been in a campaign that where we were the front runner in 1999 and 2000, I know that it's easy to say we're inevitable, but you got to be careful. And to me, they're not careful. That's presumptuous. People like to have a contest. They want to be they, and they want their vote to be asked for, not taken for granted. So if I were team Trump, I'd be trying to find ways to conciliate. I wouldn't be looking there to go out and insult everybody. I'd be trying to find a way to say, you know what, people have a right you know, to get in the race, but I'm ahead and I want to bring this party together and unite it. And instead, we've got the worst schoolyard instincts being displayed by the former president in eviscerating every one of his opponents whenever and wherever he can. But Carl, I mean, I, I take your point, but but two things on that. One is, can you honestly see Donald Trump behaving in a conciliatory way? I mean, it's just, you know, this is like asking a leopard to, to, to change its spots. And secondly, is people would say, but this kind of bombastic, aggressive, brusque approach has worked brilliant for him. It worked brilliantly for him in 2016, continues to work brilliantly for him. Why, why, why would he change? You, you raised two points. So let me respond to each one of them. First of all, he can be personally charming. He doesn't take this stuff personally. I suspect you've been in his presence. But, you know, after calling me a bunch of names, I've been in his presence and, and when he was in the White House. And, you know, he could be charming. Everybody know Carl? Carl, been, last six months been good to me. Before that, not so good. You know, and it's like he's got a certain charm. And second of all, look, if you want to win, and last time around, you lost by 7 million votes and you got 91% of the Republicans and 9% flaked on you. And things have gone wrong in a way that there are 16 percent of Republicans think that he did something criminal in the classified documents. And 20 some odd percent are hiding out by saying, well, I don't have enough to make you know, a judgment. So you got a problem. And so there are ways for you to conciliate and bring people together. But self-interest would dictate you want to unite the party, not divide the party. So, so how does he, again, as you say, you wrote about this in your column this week. So let, let's let's talk a little bit about how is Trump stopped? As you say, he's he's got this big lead in the national polls, which is probably less meaningful than people are, are giving it credit for right now. But he's and he's got a smaller lead in these initial key states. How is he stopped? Is it going to require a rapid winnowing of the field so that it's him against one or two others? That's going to, it's going to require that, is it? So does that and how does how does that happen? I mean, how do you, you know, does, do other candidates start dropping out and unifying behind, a you know, a kind of a non-Trump candidate? 
the field does need to consolidate. And, and look, it's already consolidated compared to 2016. We don't have 17 candidates. We had eight on the stage last night and four or five others who wanted to be on the stage. The next debate, I bet you there are going to be six on the stage. And by the time we get to Iowa, we may lose one or two others. But what's going to have to happen is Iowa is going to have to play a critical role in winnowing the field. And New Hampshire is going to have to maybe bring it down to no more than two or three. And then then going to, the key is going to be what happens on March 5th. On March 5th, we have our own Super Tuesday. California and Texas, two largest delegations, a bunch of other states. Over 746 delegates are going to be selected. The exact number will be set this fall after the elections in Louisiana and Virginia. But the question is going to be, that's more than half what you need to get the nomination. So yes, by, by March 5th, this has to be down to two or three at the most, probably two. And March 15th, uh, states start to be able to do winner take all, and it has to be two by then. Otherwise, it's a real problem. We're talking, uh, again, we're recording this Thursday uh, Thursday afternoon, late afternoon, East Coast time. Trump is just about, round about now, I think just a bit earlier. Yet another arraignment and yet another courtroom, this time in Fulton County, Georgia. What's your view on these? Uh, yeah, again, we saw last night that question that was asked, you know, by the moderator, you know, do you think you'd still support Trump if he's a convicted felon? And all the hands other than uh, other than Asa Hutchinson and Chris, well, Chris Christie did that rather odd waving. But as we get closer to the reality of these trials, presumably, and we don't know how many of them are actually going to happen before the election, if any of them. But but as this becomes more reality, how do you think, again, everything we've seen, it seems to suggest all this plays into his hands, the weaponization of, we heard a lot about that last night too, the weaponization of justice by the Biden Justice Department, the double standards, we get all of that, and the sense that, by, that in many ways, you know, Trump is being treated incredibly harshly. Do you see that changing, though, as, as more of the reality of these legal proceedings of these of these prosecutions uh, as, as, as they become clearer? Do you think that changes or do you think Republicans just continue to rally around him? I think it's already begun to change. I mean, again, I would point to the AP National Opinion Research Poll in which you have, in some cases, um, 35 or low 40 percent saying either he did something illegal or I don't have enough information to have an opinion, which are, are people who are hiding out. You do have a majority of people saying either I think he did something unethical but not illegal or I don't think he did anything wrong. But when you start to have a number of people like that who are saying, you know what, he did something bad or, you know what, I really don't want to tell the anonymous person calling me on the phone my opinion, but boy, it bothers me. I see this anecdotally as I travel the country. People come up to me in an airport or a hotel and say, you know what, I like what he did. I liked his policies, but he's got too much baggage. We need to turn the page. And I think that process is going to go on. And that's why last night in being able to see these people and say, you know what, stepping back, that was an accomplished group of people on the stage. Maybe one of them ought to be given a shot because they're going to be able to serve two terms. He can't. They aren't going to have the baggage. They're not going to be stuck in a courtroom. And as we get to voting, it's going to be dominated by the legal back and forth. Finally, Carl, I, want, I just want to get your take on kind of the broader question of where the Republican Party is and where it's going. You've been involved in Republican politics literally since your since your college days. Um, you know, again, you served um, successful campaigns with President George W. Bush. You've been an advisor to many other campaigns. You've been right at the heart of Republican politics for the best part of half a century, I guess. So one thing that struck me about watching the debate last night, particularly kind of gauging some of the crowd reactions, and I know they're not always the most reliable, but it was interesting. It, it, it struck me, you've got a very fluid Republican Party at the moment. You've got, you know, over the last 20 years or so, certainly before Trump, there were differences. Obviously, these primary debates would bring out these differences, but, but there was a broad measure of agreement, you know, pro-life, strong on national defense, strong supporting countries, our allies around the world and countries standing up to autocracy and authoritarian regimes like Russia. You see, last night, you just, you know, again, you heard from Vivek taking a different position on Ukraine. You heard, to some extent, Ron DeSantis taking a somewhat different position there on Ukraine. We talked already about the abortion debate and how fluid that is. Some of these other issues, we don't quite know. You know, Donald Trump has moved the party in a kind of a, certainly a not so much a small government role. He seems to be, although he did cut taxes, of course, as president. Is this a kind of, I don't know, is this a phase that the Republican Party is going through, you know, like <laughs> as, it, as, it, as it grows up? And do you think it's going to go back to those core values that we've talked about? Or do you think something quite radical is changing and that the party, that the leaders of the party are having a hard time adjusting to it? Look, both parties are disrupted. I don't think we will go back to exactly the Reagan years, but I do think the Republican Party, the values of limited government, freedom, 
strong defense. America has a role in the world. Uh, limited government, federalism, all of these things are, are enduring. And, but we are in a populist moment, and we will have to work our way through that. But both parties are broken, and they're broken, ironically enough, because of success. We won the Cold War. Uh, which was the glue that kept the, the coalition of small government conservatives and, and libertarians and uh, moderates together. I mean, it's, and similarly, the Democrats have with, you know, civil rights and to an extent, the sexual revolution, they too have achieved uh, some of their core, core uh, mission. And so both parties are just disrupted. And what's interesting is the party that gets its act together, and by that, I mean, is able to have a message that strengthens their coalition and provides a new face for the voters in 2024. I think that party is the party that's got the leg up. I mean, think about it. An 82-year-old and a 78-year-old, uh, those are the best that we can come up with. The 82-year-old, he'll be 82 at the time of the election, already suffering. The 78-year-old at the time of the election, driven by rage and anger. Is this the best we can do as a country? That's why we have the two most unpopular front runners that we have ever had. The majority of the American people want neither one of them to run for president. And that's why both parties have got a lot of work to do between now and November of 2024, because the party that gets its act together is the party that's got the upper hand. Are you one of those who thinks that actually neither Donald Trump nor Joe Biden might actually end up being the nominee of their parties? The way I put it is, if I had to bet, I'd bet on Trump and Biden being the nominees, but I'd take the field against them. I don't know why I say that, but I just think I, might, I, I just see this everywhere I go. I mean, even among Democrats and Republicans, I was in Western New York. So I was talking with a bunch of you know people who openly admitted that they were Democrats and lifelong Democrats. And, and but the disquietude about having a rematch of Donald Trump and Joe Biden left them. You know, isn't there a way for us? You know, we know it's not Robert Kennedy, but isn't there a way? I said, look, I'm not in your party, but yeah, I think there's a disquietude there. And you know, as I say, if I had to bet, I'd bet on the two front runners but I take the field against them. And I don't know how we get there, but my gut tells me at least one of the parties is going to get there. Both parties were smart. They both would get there. Yeah, it's true. We seem to have a reality that most, too many large numbers of Americans just seem to think is unreal, um, understandably. Well, Carl Rove, thank you very much indeed for joining Free Expression. Thanks, Jerry. Great to be with you. Well, that's it for this week's episode of Free Expression. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Look forward to speaking to you again next week. In the meantime, have a great week. Thank you and goodbye. <laughs>